Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Mosaic Podcast. You know, in this time of COVID, something's happening to me. There's so many things that are going on. One of the things that has happened is you would think that a guy who doesn't know how to do one podcast all that well wouldn't just up and start another one. But I've up and started another one, which is called 50 Conversations with 50 Strangers. And that thing has just literally exploded. Within three weeks' time, I've had over 75 conversations with people I don't even know. And what's happening is in that room, magic is happening. Sometimes the conversations are really exciting. Sometimes they're really boring. Sometimes they're really uh, fascinating. Sometimes they bring us to tears. Sometimes they just make us laugh. But it almost usurped all my energy from the Mosaic podcast, which I don't want to do. So when I had the opportunity to, a long time ago, have this gentleman on my podcast, I felt so good. When I first met him, he was like a real estate guy. He was doing loans and mortgages and all sorts of things for people. And I met him in a men's group. And to this day, to be honest, he's probably the only one from that men's group that I still hang out with or still love or still feel like he's my brother. I don't really, I didn't really... I was like a gentle person in the midst of, you know, wolves. Um, But it was good. I I liked everybody and everybody liked me, but there was something about him. And then he invited me to do some, a talk that he was setting up. And then he invited me on to his, his uh, Facebook lives. And then he invited me on his Facebook lives again. And over the course of time, what's happened is he's developed this amazing Uh, theory, this amazing book, this amazing process. And it's called the curiosity theory. That's the name of his book. That's the name of his process. And what he's doing now is he's starting to work with individuals. He's starting to work with corporations. He's starting to work with people because, well, let me just tell you a little bit. You know, I'm not, for those of you who listen, I'm not a big bio person, but let me just read a little bit of his bio for you. And and anyway, he sent me a bio. I asked for 50 words. He sent me one that was like 5,000 words. So I'm going to include all the bio in the show notes so you can see all of it. But, but let me just tell you a little bit about him. Martin Lopez is a real estate professional, as, you, as I already said, as well as an author, trainer, and coach in the personal development industry. His book, The Curiosity Theory, is a powerful methodology that radically changes, one, the way we look at ourselves, Two, the way we look at each other. And three, the way we look at life. The curiosity theory gives people alternatives during tense and stressful situations. This allows them to powerfully interact and versus repeating the same mistakes over and over. As a trainer, Martin's worked with everyone from startups, corporate CEOs, one-on-one coaching and high performance teams. His superpower, and you know me, I hate that word, but he likes it, so I'm going to read it. His superpower is uncovering blind spots and strengthening professional and personal relationships. And he's good at it. And the theory that he developed just enhances the natural talent that he brings to life in general. So rather than this be a soliloquy, it's supposed to be a conversation. And so with that, I am going to button it up and say to you, Martin Lopez, welcome to the Mosaic Podcast. How the heck are you, brother? I'm doing really good. I like cracking up like at the words I'm using to like describe what I do and how I operate, like that superpower. And words are a trip, aren't they? They're, they're... Words have power. And, yeah. and, and everything about, like for me, I'm, I'm the anti guy in a lot yeah. of things because so many, so many people use these words and they just become words that people say. And we talk about these superpowers and having this ability and being extraordinary and being more than everything. And for me, the, the mosaic is all about absolute, the absolute beauty of being just who we are, which is beautifully ordinary individuals. And that our superpowers, we don't need superpowers. All we need to be is to be ourselves. Because even even friggin' Superman takes off his cape every once in a while, right? But he's always who he is. You know, he may not he may not be flying, but he's still he's still gracious. He's still powerful. He's still yeah. in that kind of like in that 
midst of wolves, like you said, he's still powerful. And it doesn't yeah. really look powerful. He puts the glasses on as though that takes away his power, but we know it's there. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was thinking about that word, my superpower. I just would, you know, I'm kind of good at this, like that. That should be kind of, <laughs> like if I was going to say, what's my bio? It's like, hey, guys, I'm just kind of good at getting people to stop arguing. I'm just kind of You're good not kind. At in, in all due respect, you're not kind of good. You are good. That's what you do. That's what you did from the first moment I met you. Yeah. So you can already tell Martine is a beautiful soul with a beautiful heart who, who even in the midst of me, like looking at the words of his bio and, and sort of analyzing them, he doesn't take offense. He just, he's, he's there and he's curious, which is beautiful. Martine, place us into perspective a little. What did your parents do that, I would just get a sense of how you came into this world, what, what they did, how, what you saw in them. Wow. Um, I was supposed to be a girl. <laughs> okay. And my first recollection is, uh, was disappointment. That was my first recollection is that my father had me and I got it. It's not a girl, the third boy. Wow. Wow. Uh, my mom wa had turned 19, uh, two weeks before I was born wow. and I was her third child. Wow. Uh, yeah. So interesting life. My father was maybe 24, maybe barely 24. And he was a, he was from Mexico. He was actually from Tijuana. My father grew up actually very wealthy. Uh, my father-in-law, my great, my grandfather, not my father, my grandfather was a big radio personality, very controversial. So he would be like Hannity, like that big, huge. Wow. In fact, they named a city after him. There's a part of Mexico that's named after him. There's no city there, but it's a part of Mexico. So he went from, you know, living a, a life of, of silver spoons to uh, then it was eight kids. He was 12 years old and it was my grandmother. And that was it. And I guess they kept on, they held on to a couple of the houses. And oh, then hold on, slow down, slow down a minute because I'm getting a little confused. So your grandfather was this radio personality. I'm, I'm assuming because you picked the word ha Hannity. Yes. He was a conservative voice in, in, the, in the voice of Mexico. I, I don't know that he was conservative or not. He was controversial. So he, he you know, from what I've heard, what people have told me is that he, you know, he started a lot of shit, for lack of a better word. You know, he just would talk, say how it is. And, um, and then uh, he was assassinated. So the story he is... He was assassinated. He was assassinated. So his driver survived. His car went off a cliff. And he had a bullet in the back of his head. So it's kind of like, you know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How old were you when that happened? My father was 12. Oh, your father was 12 when your grandfather was assassinated. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So your father was 12. And then how did, and then now your grandfather's out of, is gone. Yeah. Your, your dad is with grandma. The, did they stay and affluent or did they lose? Kids. And eight kids. Did eight they kids. stay affluent or did they lose everything no. when you're? Well, in Mexico, you don't have, like when you're a woman, you don't have the stuff. So the stuff was divided up amongst people. And then she ended up with a couple homes. Uh, one of the homes wasn't in a very good area. It was in a kind of a, a rough area. So then they grew up in a kind of a rough area. Wow. With eight kids. So, and then he met my mom and um, my grandmother, uh, who just, everything like the people i tell you like who would you want to meet if you could meet anybody in the world if you can i'd see my grandmother again wow. that's what i'd see again wow. and she was the she was the daughter of a mistress she her mom was a mistress so the that's who she was and she had some really interesting stories and um so that's kind of like all right I, was she was she the no okay the mistress was she, the, she was the daughter of your grandfather's mistress of her father's mistress. Of her father's mistress. Would have been my great grandfather. Your great grandfather. That's not the radio personality. No, I'm that's. Try, I'm so trying to. Side. I need that's a scorecard. A, yeah, that's on the other side. Okay. So that's how you know. So that's kind of like who they, who they, you know, who who I was raised by. I was raised by that, and uh, my my grandmother would always make comments that that we were the first that me and my brothers were the first kids that she ever hugged. She didn't even hug her own children. Wow. And then, and so, and my mom would talk about that. Like, I don't know what you did to your grandmother, but all of a sudden she just loved kids. She never liked kids. She had eight of them. So, um, 
you know, it was a lot of uncles and stuff. And, and so it, it, we, I had a fun, I had a fun life. Um, but I never got along with my father ever. Uh, I, I never, I never trusted him. I never, it was always like something was going to drop. Why? Then, what, what, what was it about him that you didn't trust? I just, I just, he was volatile. I just didn't trust his volatility. I just thought there was something. And, and this is the thing. He was amazing with my mother. I mean, if you want like a, a, a picture book story of a romance, I mean, they, to, to this day, I'm still inspired by the way my father loved my mother and the way she loved him. It's just still, it was beautiful. I didn't feel that. I didn't feel that kind of connection. So and that was my thing. That wasn't that they necessarily were doing anything. I take complete responsibility for that. So, um, but hold on, you were a kid. How is it your thing? Well, it was my thing because it was my experience. I take, you know, I take, yeah, but yeah, I look at like my experience. My experience was this, whether that was happening or not, it was still my experience. Were and you that, were you punished? Were you beaten? Were you yeah. banked? Were you? Oh yeah, I was yeah. banked. Yeah. Banked pretty bad. At, my father was a contractor and um, I don't know how many times he did this, but it was at least a few times. Um, you know, the, those big saws that cut wood, you, yeah. know, you know, and the ones you push them, he would get a two by four and he would cut a part of the two by four. And that's what he would hit us with wow. or hit me with. Wow. Like, and, I, and, and this is what I remember. What I remember is I would, I would just look at him like, like, it's not that you're hitting me. I just couldn't understand why you would hit me for what I did. Like why I'm being hit for what I did. Like I, like the pain and the fear and all that was nothing to the confusion of like, why are you doing this for what I just did? Like it just, that never made sense to me. Wow. So it always been. So step up from it a little bit. Now look back on it. Did you do anything now looking back on it where you could see, oh, God, I know now why he did that? Or was it just he got mad and you were the you were the recipient of his aggression? I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story. Uh, when I was when my son was 10 years old, my son Jordan was 10 years old. He had done something and we were at a friend's house and I was going to punish him. I was really upset what he did. It was, just, you know. It was like, that's a terrible thing he did, right? One of those. And so I put him in the car and I was, and all the way home, it was probably about um, two miles. And I was, I was trying to scare him. I was like, you're going to get in trouble when we get home. We got home. He went into the room. I said, come over here. And, and I was like, and I was trying to intimidate him. I was trying to scare him. So I took a belt out and I started to spank him. And from the first spank and the second spank, I realized that I was relieving my own pain and nothing to do with him. And in those moments, in those moments, I just sat on the bed and I started to cry. Wow. And I just got, I am so sorry. Wow. I am so sorry. Yeah. You can feel it even now, right? Look. Yeah. And, and uh, how many years ago was that? Probably about, uh, probably about 10 years ago. Wow. And I just, I just realized that, I just realized in that moment that what my father did had nothing to do with me. It was how he relieved his own pain. And where was your mother during all this time? Was she just scared, scared to death of him? Because apparently she had a good relationship with him. It oh, she had a great relationship with him. Um, so I do these podcasts. I do, I do these podcasts. And then um, and I did a podcast. Uh, you might even have been on that one. It was about truth. I think you were on it. And... Um, she calls me a couple days later and she said, Oh, I watched your podcast. It's really, really good. And I said, Oh, great. And I was getting in the car. I was driving to, a, to an appointment and she said, um, I have a question for you. And I go, yeah, what, you know, what's up mom? And she says, um, can you tell me why you hate your dad so much? Wow. And I said to her, I said, mom, um, I don't think you have enough time. Wow. And she goes, I, I, I want to know. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll share it with you. But I, but I, I've got some ground rules for our conversation, if that's okay. And she said, yeah. I said, so I'm going to ask you not to take anything personal because it has to do with his relationship and my relationship. It has nothing to do with you. And I'm going to ask you not to defend him, not to defend what I say. She said, okay. So uh, this was pr- like probably like two and a half months ago. Wow. And um, she said, uh, 
she just listened, 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 and she said, I'm sorry, I didn't know how to protect you. Wow. So did she know it was going on, but she didn't know how to protect you, or she just didn't even know it was going on and didn't know how to protect you? She knew what was going on. She was 15. She came from a different world. You know, her mother didn't, her mother never hugged her and kissed her. And, you know, and <laughs> my grandma was a trip, man. My grandma was, she's kind of like a badass Mexican woman. She wow. was probably maybe not even five feet tall. And, and she wasn't to be trifled with, you know, she was, you know, she grew up, you know, she grew up basically on a plantation in Mexico. And then they moved over here with a very wealthy father and you know there were mistresses and she was one of the kids wow. that's her life and she was pretty much married off i think she was married off at 12 or 13 to like a 35 year old or something wow yeah wow interesting world that there is out there in the 1900s the early 1900s wow. yeah and so that's you know there's all this that goes on you know in life and and i just kind of figured it's time to start healing this stuff congratulations but, you know and and my thought is that and it's a louise hay thing you hey house guy you know it's like you if you can heal your you can heal yourself you can heal five generations forward and five generations back yeah and uh that's what i'm doing i'm healing myself wow yeah martin do you think what the way it was in the 1900s is pretty much still the way it is now or do you think things have evolved I think it's evolved, but I don't think we've figured it out. Yeah. I, that's my thought is I think it's evolved, but we haven't figured it out. And so we've got this thing called personal development. We got this thing like self-help and stuff. And we got these things like, you know, I would consider, what is it called? Uh, uh, what are women that are, are um, what's that called? A women's lib? What are they? What Me are they too. Feminist. Me too. Feminist. Feminist. Yeah. I, my mom, I believe my mom was a feminist and, and, and she had said that. So I decided I was going to be a feminist. Just like I decided I was going to be a Democrat because of the color of my skin, and that's what everybody was, you know. But those were, that was one of the things I took on is my mom was a feminist, so I took on a feminist. And I think what happens, I think what we're inside of is we're inside of a pendulum shift. Yeah. And so we go, listen, I, you know, I'm black and I got no rights, and I need, I need rights. And they go, Psh, and we do that. And then that swings the pendulum, right? Yeah. And some people don't like that. And some people love it. And, but the pendulum's swinging like this. And then people are, and this pendulum's got to come back. So then it comes back. And then at the same time, we go, you know, this Vietnam War thing is like not very cool. You did it in Korea and you did it in World War II. Like, you know, we're going to do something about that. Like people are dying. You know, it's, it's this, and, and we start to move and we start to change. And then, and then uh, you know, Jonathan Livingston Siegel and, and um, who's the Scientology guy, you know, L. Ron Hubbard, and then, you know, uh, Norman Vincent Peale, all these guys that are great thought leaders that are a, that have a, a new way to bring information to the masses, books and television. <laughs> and, 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 and people start to become aware and they start to watch and they start to implement and they start to grow. And, and I think we grow as a separation, like, uh, not like anybody saying I'm better than you, but I, but at the same time, they're saying I'm different than you. Yeah. And, and so we got this pool of people that are different than, and I think what's going to happen, and I pray that it's going to happen, is that it comes back and that we decide that we're not any different than anybody. And that we start to look at color, not as something different, but something I like. I really like that guy with the dark skin. Like yeah. the dark skin's beautiful or the, or the pale skin's beautiful. And yeah. that we notice it like we notice the color blue or we notice the, the writing and we go, whoa, or we notice the mosaic and we notice the mosaic, the thing. And we look at that and we, and we, and we, 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 we get fixed, transfixed on it. And we look at it and we, uh, we dive into it and we we're curious about it. And we go, yeah. wow, that's really cool. So when someone with dark skin shows up that we look at them and we go like, wow, or someone with light skin, we go, wow, you got like beautiful skin like that. Like that's as much, Right. As we see in somebody else, you know? Right, right. And um and 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 then we and then the curiosity theory shows up and then we go, Wow, I think that uh Mexicans are uh bad people that come across the border, you know? And then we go, Wow, wow, let me let me like let me think about that thought myself. Wow, that's interesting that I have that thought. I'm curious where that thought came from. Yeah. Uh, and then we have like thoughts like, you know, these, uh, these, uh, uh, what do they call them? White supremacists. Well, those are bad people. 
Well, not to them. Right. Not to them. Okay, well, but they are to me. So why am I making them a bad person? Yeah. Because they don't like me. Well, they don't have to like me. Yeah. You know, it's it's just, it's, it's, it's like, why are we, because we've become so transfixed on like our idea as though our idea has to be, has to be what's out there versus yeah. like, wow, wow, like this guy doesn't like Mexicans because he's a white supremacist. And I would just probably go talk to him and just try to find out like why he thinks that way. And then I go, okay, great. Thanks for sharing with me. And then I would just yeah. leave because I would understand that. Yeah. As much as, and this is the thing, I would understand it as much as he could articulate it. Yeah. And what I found with curiosity is that once we say what we say so many times, it's no longer the truth for us anymore. It's no longer the truth? What does that mean? Um, like I've said things to people. And as I said them, I thought it was the truth coming out. But when it came out, it was like, oh, shoot, I don't feel that way. I know I just said that. I don't, that's not, I got that's you. not true for me anymore. What happens in that moment? Because the other side, that's, that's sort of, I love that because it's the exact opposite of what most people would do, think. Yeah. Because you would tend to think the more you repeat something, the more you do believe it. That's been the story of my life. Yeah. I've told the same stories over and over and over and over again. I remember um, telling a story about living in New York. and and But we never lived in New York. But <laughs> I had said the same story over and over again. And I said it on interviews. I said it to people I loved. I said it to friends. I said it... But there wasn't an ounce of truth in it until finally it was coming out of my mouth. And I said, hold on one minute. There's no truth to that story. I mean, we never lived in New York, but I've said it so many times to myself that I actually believe it. And, and that case is so easy to understand. But how about when I say to myself, I'm not good enough so many times, or I'm not handsome enough, or I'm not young enough, or I'm not smart enough, or I'm not capable enough you know those are stories that we say over and over again till we believe them and but you're saying there's a moment where that switch is where you say no i don't believe that anymore yeah because i don't think we listen to ourselves saying what we say for the most part we say what we say but we don't listen to ourselves saying it and often it's a monologue so it, it goes around in here and then when we say it there's a there's something different that's in it's there's so many different parts of it components to it there's the vibration of sound right. you know and, and 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 sound comes from something like we're really vibrating when you think of god and and jehovah and you think of all these different in buddha there's a vibe oh, oh, there's a oh, there's the you know and when we meditate oh, there's that there's that that's the vibration so we say devil well that doesn't have the same vibration yeah. right but Lucifer has the same vibration and a little bit of it. Yeah. So people go to it. So there's, there's energy and there's words. We, I, what I try to teach people is to be curious about those words, curious about the vibration, curious about what comes out of your mouth, what's in here. So when I say it changes the way that we look at ourselves, because we're curious. So we look at ourselves as we say what we say, as we think what we think, as we feel what we feel as we make up stories about the things we make up, let's just, just be curious about that to see what that is. Simply so, be curious. So let me dive into this a little bit yeah. because I would get it if the first time people said it, they had that revelation, but it isn't the first time people mm -hmm. say it. Not at all. So what switches, because I get all the sound and I get all the vibration and I get all that because, you know, we're here in California and of course I get it. And I've been in that, in, in that world for 45 years, so I'm not a stranger to that world. That's right. But why when we say it the X time, whatever X is, 100,000, five times, eight times, whatever that X is, why all of a sudden in that moment from the, from the work that you're doing with people, what happens that they hear it that moment and it changes, whereas they've said it so many times before that it didn't change a thing? Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I just know how to do it for them. So, okay. So is it because you are in the room with them and you become curious about it? Oh, and absolutely. you ask. So it's about, so it's about a process. It isn't that they don't say, it isn't that as they say the same story over and over again, suddenly they say, hold it, that's not what I believe anymore. 
It's that they have an interaction with somebody like you or someone trained in your, in your way, methodologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they say, you say to somebody, okay, hold on one minute. Like, I get that that's what you're a white supremacist and that's what you feel. Well, why do you feel that? I'm curious. Yeah. And, and when they get to say it to someone who, who stops them in their tracks and says, wait one minute, like, let's dive deeper into that. Then I, then I understand that there's a, there's a moment where if they're willing to embrace it, they just say, hold it. I'm not really sure why I believe that. I was just, I was just taught that to believe, I was taught to believe that. Yeah. I, I decided as I grew up based on my experiences and based on what I saw, I decided a few things and I told myself those things and I commanded my brain for those things. And I haven't as an adult recommanded my brain. I haven't told my brain, hey, let's, let's do something else. It, like what I, what I realized for myself is that I, made, I gave myself commands. And then my brain said, or my ego said, all right, let's go do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, all right. And it, just like a program, I programmed it and I said it. And it was intentional on accident. It was accidentally intentional. It was intentional to live, to survive, to get the girl, to play in the band, to whatever it was, to close the deal, whatever it was, it worked. And I, and, and then I did it again and I did it again and I did it again and I did it again. And it just followed patterns and it brought in other patterns and it, everything kind of like worked itself out. And then I ended up a particular human being. And then I was not the human, I was no longer in charge of that human being. It was, it was all automatic. Then what I do is I take people and then I, and then they say what they say. And then I, and then I stand next to them. It's kind of like this, like I'm talking to somebody like this, right? This is another person and I'm talking and I go, hold on one second. And we both look in the same. So you're, that's what you're talking about. And they go, yeah. And then we start taking that apart together. So is that a self practice also? Because when you picked the hat up, I could see that being you talking to yourself as well. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm curious about, I'm curious about what I, what I, uh, what I read, what I journal, what I write, um, what I say. I'm stay, I just stay curious. So do me a favor. Uh huh. You're familiar with overhead projectors, are you? Yeah. Okay. I have to find a new image that gets, is, is as clear for me presently as that one is for me. I want to point out something real quick, right before you say it, hold that thought, okay? Please. So what we're doing right now, if you're watching the podcast, you listen to the podcast, what we're doing is we're gaining clarity inside of something that's important to somebody. I have no idea what Danny's going to say, but I have no agenda about it. Yeah. So I'm present. I'm here to serve and I'm here to listen to what he said. Danny is exercising a need. I need to understand. I need to look at it in this context to understand. So I'm now going to look at the context that Danny sets up. Perfect. To understand what he's talking about. And as long as we're playing perspective, let me play perspective for you as to what, what's coming through on my end. Thank you. Because you'll see how beautiful the world starts to look when you take a time to just enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I'm trained in listening. I love to listen to people speak and I love to hear what they say. When I hear pieces of their mosaic that don't that I don't understand that doesn't mean they're conflicting it doesn't mean they said something wrong it doesn't mean it means quite frankly I just don't understand them <laughs> so I, simple. I, it's so simple it doesn't mean I'm trying to intimidate them it doesn't mean I'm trying to could argue with them I literally want to throw it back and say hold it I didn't get this piece yeah can you show me how this piece and this piece fit into the philosophy of what you're saying so that I can understand you better and that I can hear what you're saying better because when I hear this and I hear this initially, it doesn't, it, it's out. It, it doesn't connect. Yes. So from Martin's Martin's perspective, you hear what he, what's going on through his methodology, through my methodology, you hear what's happening here. Beautiful way to break down a conversation. I love this. Yes. Um, so if you were to have an overhead projector, and an overhead projector for those of you millennials who have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a machine we used in school that sat on a, that sat on a table 
and the machine was made up of light and it shot light up in on and you would put plastic sheets on top of it with writing on it or pictures or whatever it was and the plastic sheet with the light on it would come through an, like an arm that reached out and would project it onto the screen in front of the room so that everybody could see it and it was a big image for people before we had all this technology and things that we have now it was a it was pretty much a prehistoric way to communicate to crowds that were bigger than a few but i love the image because we would put one plastic image on it and then another plastic image on it so i want to put on to your the first piece i want to put on to to the overhead projector is the piece of your curiosity this curiosity that looks and says i want to stand up right from this face up and i want to look at it and then i want to put on top of that your relationship with your dad and i'm sure you've done work there with you within yourself i don't think i've done what you're asking me to do a beautiful yeah. So, so I love that because you're my yeah. brother. I, I, I love that we can, can, we can play in the same place. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to step out just as if he was a white supremacist, just as he was, if yeah. he was a, an anti Mexican, just as he, just, yeah. just because this was the person that he had without the judgment of what you have, which is so easy to give to him because he's your dad. He's the person you look to to protect you and he's swatting the heck out of you and beating you mm -hmm. and abusive what does the image on that on the screen look like now with both those images on it so i'm going to share with you what happened to me and i'm going to ask you to re-say what you said okay and i'm going to ask people listen so watch so what happens is danny says what he says and i have what i want to do with what he says which is say what i want to say so I'm holding on to what I want to say so I don't forget what I want to say so I stop listening to Danny. Hmm. I assume I think he knows what he's talking about. I have no idea what Danny's talking about. And because I have no idea what Danny's talking about and I have something I want to say, I can't hear what Danny's saying. So I want to take responsibility for that. Beautiful. That's what's, I think that's what's missing in conversation. So being responsible for where I was now saying, Danny, I, I think I heard your words, but I was listening to me. Yeah. Thanks for the background music. Can you, can you say it again? And probably what it was is I don't want to go there. Yeah. I want to be right about whatever I want to be right about. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to say it again. Would you do that for me? Absolutely. And before we do it, I want to put it into the, I want to, I want to do this because I've never had a conversation where two people are so engaged in their processes that we can actually sit down and analyze a conversation, which I would love to do more of with you yeah. in, front of, in front of people, because I think Absolutely. this is exquisite. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally open for that. I keep telling my therapist, I go, yeah, should we just keep recording this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> I told him I'm going to fire him so we can write a book. Yeah, absolutely. So at a certain point in time, what happens in everybody's life is we listen to a place where we stop listening because we're no longer listening to what's being said. Mm -hmm. We're starting to formulate what it is we will return back to it. I'm not saying that's exactly what Martin's doing, but there are a lot of reasons we do that. We do that because we're scared to be vulnerable. We do that because we don't want to be wrong. We do that because we feel like something might have come up that we haven't, that we don't feel comfortable looking at. We do that because just sometimes we just aren't, aren't curious enough to listen longer. Right. And, 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 but when we stop listening to what a person's saying, we we're out of conversation. Yes. Right. We're, yeah. we're, we, we've left the conversation and we might as well go watch a baseball game. Right? <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> because, because, they got our own thing going on. Yeah. Because we're not talking anymore. And so I want you to see the courage and the brilliance of Martin that he can stop and say, hold on. I left this conversation a little while back and I just want to make sure that I understand. I want to make sure I hear you. I want to deal with the demons that keep me from having this conversation. Yeah. 
and I want to have this conversation or yeah. not. I mean, we don't have to go any further. We've already made enough points in this conversation that we don't even have to go here if we don't want to. If you don't, I, want to keep, if I like going. This is okay. This, fabulous. This is, this is why I breathe. Okay. Fabulous. So the question is earlier on in our conversation, we were talking about the situation with your dad. Yes. And how your dad chose you as the beating pole. And how you, in your goodness of heart, said it was all my situation. It had nothing to do with him. But that's a little bit of BS in, in the way I, yeah. that I look at it. Because, because the truth of the matter is, you may whatever you did wrong didn't, in, didn't, didn't entitle you to have that beating. Yeah, the crime didn't finish the crime. Finish it, yeah. yeah, you don't you don't kill somebody for taking a bubble gum. You know, from yeah. the right. I mean, yeah. you you punish them. You put, put yeah. them in their room for a little bit. Exactly. So whatever happened in that conversation there, were, and, and that wasn't just one situation from what I'm, when I picked up from, and I may yeah. be assuming now, because in my listening process, I'm now assuming that that didn't just happen once that happened. It, it was to me the way it seemed my life was, it seemed my life was a constant waiting for the shoe to drop. Like, yeah. like I'm talking into my adulthood. I'm talking into my, into having kids as well into my father coming over every Friday night telling me how much he loves me, how proud of me he is and loving my kids and all that. I was waiting. I basically waited for the shoe to drop and it did. Oh. It did drop. It would drop. Yeah. It dropped. So, so many overhead projector screens that we could put on, but, but let's just stay where we were. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. So we stay in that place where it seems like this is the reality of the situation. Now let's put on top of that another plastic sheet, which is a white, a white supremacist doesn't like me because I'm, I've come across the border and I'm Mexican mm -hmm. or I live here and my skin's a different color. Yes. And he hates me. But if I can sit down with him and just like understand with him and talk to him and say, I, you hate me. I mean, is that really what happens to you? Tell me why you hate me. And he'll go on and on and on. And you can be curious about it. And, and you just, you're, you're in the listening aspect and just reflecting back to him. If I'm getting it right, what you're doing, yeah. you can yeah. tell me better. But you, you're basically reflecting back. Boy, I'm curious about that. Like, is that really what, you, like now that you're sitting with me and we're having some conversation, has any of that changed for you? Do you see somebody different than you saw initially? In my book, The Mosaic, Mo sees people initially. He sits and speaks with them, and, and they're totally different people after he sits and speaks with them and listens to them. And I bet in a white supremacist conversation, if they would have it with you, that you would not walk away in the same way. They might say, I hate Mexicans, but I like you. <laughs> and that's happened. Right, right. That, that exact thing has happened. I, and I'm sure. And so... I want you now to put that process that you did with the white supremacists, which actually happened like that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Wow. On, on the sheet of your dad. Okay. Wow. Well, uh, I don't think I can do that right now. Okay. Very I honest. Don't, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to separate the anger and drop my guard and uh, I am willing to redo this with you. Yeah. And walk through a process with you and film yeah. it yeah. i'm willing to do that because i think well first off i'd like to get through it and i think it would help a lot of other people i heard every word you said then there's words you said that are like literally like and i can physically feel them are like a like a block right here yeah and it's the block is red and i know what the f that block i well what you know, I just, right. I just went completely right. dumb. So first of all, thank you for being so raw, so real, so vulnerable, so honest. So, so, I mean, look at the way this man is showing up and he doesn't have to, he could have just made up an answer and, and, and skirted around it. Right. Yeah. I also said to him, we don't have to talk about it. He could have said, great, we got the idea. Let's keep going. Yeah. But he didn't do any of that. And so for those of you who are listening to this show, where is your curiosity? 
where is your ability to listen shut off? Where do you speak a game of I listen to people? But you and you do you listen for a certain amount of time. It's like the guy who goes to see his teacher and he says teacher, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. And the teacher says, go north. And the guy's so excited because he's been so stuck for so long at where he's been, that he just runs off and takes off and runs north. And for the first few blocks, it's effortless and easy. Then he gets a few more blocks away. And it turns out to be the, the hardest, the hardest path he's ever been on. He's, he's literally with a machete chopping down and the ground underneath him becomes like quicksand. And he's so he's chopping and sinking and chopping and sinking. And, and he says, this is crazy. I'm going back to my teacher to say, what the heck's going on? And he went back to his teacher and he said, I was stuck. I thought I was stuck before, but you know, I listened to you. I went, I went north and for three blocks, it was great, but then it turned into, it turned to hell. Yeah. And, and the teacher said, yeah, because you didn't listen. <laughs> I said, go north, but you were out the door before I could say for three blocks, and then yeah. I want you to go east. That's what we do in conversations. Yeah. We hear it for a little bit because we, we're so excited that we're listening. We're so excited that we're curious. That we listen and we're curious for a little while until then it shuts down. Your thoughts? Um, I wrote that I want to address what we were dealing with which I think is the same thing you're talking about. So how does it show up? Like, why does it show up? And I'm going to say why it shows up for me. And I don't assume that it shows up the same way for anybody. And I hope that people can get value from what I'm saying. Like, that's the goal. That's I the, think that's, by the way, I think that's already happened. Okay. So I'm going to go deeper into it. Okay. Yeah. These go, are bonus points. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I was trying to, as you were talking, I was trying to figure that out. So I, and the, the, the thing was, is I said, I can't handle. And then I wrote, I don't think I can handle the level of pain that would show up in that conversation. Like, I don't know how to cry. I don't know how to let go. And, and, and like everything changes and, and like the immediate, like going from, you know, just took a shower, went for a walk on the beach this morning, you know, I was in Del Mar, like, you know, walking on the beach with some friends and dogs and just having a great time, you know, and then I'm going to go hang out with friends right now and stuff. And, but I'm going to go from this life, this perfect life to this pain and this other thing where in here, like logically, I know that it will be like, I'd be on another, I'd be at another level. Like it would heal something. Yeah. But Jesus Christ, the pain of healing sometimes is, it's never as bad as the fear, as the, as the resistance. It's never as bad as that. But the resistance has a way of knocking on the door. Yeah. And, yeah. and saying, hey, don't go there. Yeah. We're shutting off our brain so that we can't hear anymore. Yeah curiosity has me consider something else, which is even what I'm saying right now. So I can start to consider, okay, well, let me go, let me look. Does the, does the pain actually, does it, are you going to just cry for the rest of your life? I don't think I'm going to, I might, I don't know. Let's see. Yeah. But then, so then I, I become curious about it and I see. Yeah. So, if I was to put a, if I was to put a, a different film on top of that, I probably start to ask him questions that were about him and not about me. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't try to be healing myself in the conversation with him. That's that's what I wouldn't be. And, I, and as a child, as his son, needing him to be my father and do what he does as a father, that's what I need. That's about me. Yeah. When I am talking to a white supremacist or anybody, I'm present for them because I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Like I, I have lived a thousand life, like literally lived a thousand, I'm on borrowed time. And I'm like, if I die tomorrow, you tell everybody that like, <laughs> I far exceeded anything I'd ever do. Yeah. Far exceeded. 
and far experienced love at any level that I could ever experience love. So I'm good. And I'm planning on living a long time to help people. So I'm good. But with that relationship, I still need something. So if I can just jump in, it's, yeah. it, I love when a conversation comes full circle. And I love what we talked about in the beginning, how it raises its head in the middle and in the end. And um, I just want to invite the listener. And this is Martine being vulnerable. I, I'm happy to be in the same place on the other, on the other side of, of the conversation, but that's not how this one's going right now. But because Martine has opened up so much and we're, and it's, we're talking about him on, on this podcast. Um, can you see how many things um, let me phrase it a little differently. Can you see how the stories we tell ourselves dictate our, our reality? So Martin has a story that for a white supremacist, he'd be fine to sit there with him. Most of us would be scared to death to sit with a white supremacist and have that conversation because we would be scared to death of what they would do to us. Martine says, I'm on borrowed time, so he can't do anything to me that I already sh I shouldn't already be here anyway. If he kills me, I'm on borrowed time, so so be it. But I'm not going to be killed by him. I'm, uh, I, I'm not going to let that happen. But, but with my dad, <laughs> but with my dad, it's so funny. It is so funny to hear it from your lips. Go keep right. going. Man. No, no, but but that but that that's what I'm trying to say. And am I, <laughs> I, I and am I going to cry? And did you see how beautifully he teared up already in this conversation? He's not scared of crying. No. But there's these there are these there are these stories that we've told ourselves over and over and over again. And Martin is being so vulnerable and so beautiful. And he's not talking about the curiosity theory. He's showing it to you. And as deep as you go in the curiosity theory, from my, from my view of what's happening, you just continue to dive down. When you hit, that, when you hit the next story, you just go into the next story. But doesn't mean, it, do, it, it doesn't mean that getting from story one to story two is not valuable. That, the work that's already been done in this episode is is fascinatingly beautiful. And Martine said, hopefully there'll be some value you'll get from it. Well, there'll be no value you'll get from it if you only put, if you say, oh, that's interesting, Martine does that. Yeah. The question is, what are the stories you're telling yourself? Where are the places you stop listening? And where are the places that you could invite curiosity in? Because every single piece is, that is not connected disrupts your mosaic. Every single piece that's not connected. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Every single thing absolutely. that happens. And, and when we were talking about the color of the skin earlier, well, the beauty of a mosaic is it's made up of different colors. Nobody looks at a mosaic and says, this color isn't the right color. This color is better than that color. Yep. This color, we might say, I like this color more than that color, but no color is better or worse. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I throw something in real quick? Uh, go, sure. It's like this racism conversation, right? It shows contrast. It says, not a racist, a racist. Okay. So what I'm saying is, so what are you? Yeah. You know what you don't want to be. Yeah. So just be what you want to be. And, and, and even interestingly enough, I was having some of these conversations and someone told me about a Harvard test that, that's, that's administered and it's an easy test. It's a multi, it's a, it's a, it's a choice where it's a, you, you see these images and from those images, they do it around money. They do it around color. They do it around the, uh, uh, uh a lot of sex, sex, Just the sexuality. Bias, right? What's that? It, just, it shows bias. Yeah, it shows bias. Yeah, yeah. So I took, they sent it to me and I took the, the one on, on race. And you have to understand, when I was born, I think there was only one or two times in my entire life I was upset with God. 
When I was born, I was upset with God, not because I came here, but because I looked down at my skin color and I said, you told me I was going to be a black guy, black, black guy. Why? You, I'm, I'm, I'm pissed at you. You made me a white man. What the hell happened? What, what the hell people? happened? I, I'm supposed to be a black guy. That was the agreement. <laughs> so, so from that perspective, I would. out the door before they finished the conversation. I, 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 went, I went two blocks and I didn't listen for the rest of it. But from that perspective that I have of the way I came in and, and my own feelings about being so in sync with black people, I was shocked at the bias test results that I took. Yeah. Because inherent in our language, there's a white house, there's enlightenment and being in, and casting out the dark. Yes. There are so many images that show white is good and light is good and dark is bad and black is bad at, that I, caught, I, I couldn't even catch myself because the images were so quick of, of what it was and built into our very systems are racist beliefs because the words that we use, um, I, when it's dark, all you have to do is turn on the light. Well, what color is light? It isn't black, it's white. Unless it is black. You can turn on a black light. You know, well, Actually, light is devoid of color. It's devoid of color. But when you look at it in a room, you think, oh, that's light, right? The cowboys wore white, the good guys wore white hats. The bad guys wore black hats, right? Everything is, it's all just so. It's part of narrative and it's all part of the way we're built. We're put together, we're put together in uh, narratives were put together in stories and we live out the stories we're living out the stories but we yeah. didn't make the stories yeah. we just were put in the stories yeah and so if you could invite people to be more curious especially now in this time what would you say to them to allow them to open up that door? If I would invite them to be curious, yeah. I would just say, I would just say, stay curious. I would just do that. It's like a command. I want to put a command inside of you so that you do that because what you command, you will do. Okay. So it's kind of like I would, I would give it as a command so that we operate inside actions of the command. If I was, if I was going to do that, if I was having a dialogue, it would be different. Okay. So it's two different kind of things. So, Martine, in the world that we're living in, is this the world you always wanted to give over to your children? I don't have a judgment of the world. I, have, I see contrast. And then I understand that we have choice inside of the contrast. So I don't have a judgment over, um, I don't have a judgment over, like I don't say that's wrong and this is right. I, I have things that I don't do as a result of how I um, experiences I want and the experiences I want other people to have. And there's experiences I would like the world to have, but there's no way there's, I don't have the arrogance or the bravado. I don't have the right to think that I know how other people are to live their lives and to, and to think that I know that how this person's path should be. Yeah. So my goal is to have, is to ask people to be curious in their path, whatever that path is, and see if that helps you. Like, Love see it. if that helps you. Love it. Yeah. Martin, what a, what a fabulous conversation. I miss you, brother. I love you too, man. I miss you too. And what, a, fa right the street. <laughs> what a fabulous, fabulous conversation. Um, if people are intoxicated with you and want to know more, or want to work with you, do something with you, how would they get in touch with you? Uh, the curiositytheory.com is the best way to connect with me. It's really the best way. I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn and, and um, what is it? Uh, Instagram. But uh, really, uh, you can go to my, 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 my curiosity three page. And then if you, you know, if you want to work with me, then there's, there's ways to work with me there. And yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And we'll have all that in the show notes. Um, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I'm watching you become a person that 
I hope you're really proud of. Yeah. Because the, you, the growth that I've seen in you over the course of these years is just so beautiful. I mean, we, we're all growing together, but the growth that I've seen in you from where we first met to where you are now and what this curiosity theory has brought through to you is just so fascinating. For those of you who are listening, please check out the curiositytheory.com. Please engage Mar uh, Martine and work to, to do with you if, you if you're stuck in a certain place. And for those of you who are listening, I want to thank you so much for listening. If you like this episode, please give it some pretty little stars um, and write a review about it. And also, more than anything, share it with your friends. Because in this world that we're living in, where there's so much noise, the thing that seems to have the most value is when someone we love tells us about something they loved. Hmm. And we share it with it and they share it with it. And we don't have to sell anybody on anything. We just say, this was great. I love this conversation. I think you might like it. If they like it, great. If they don't like it, great. You don't have to anymore. But that's the way things spread. Um, again, Martine, thank you so much. Is there any last thing you want to say that I didn't ask you before we go? Well, when you, when you acknowledge me, where I'm, where I, where I go is, um, is how I'd like to be seen in other people's eyes. And like, what an honor to be seen in your eyes that way. Wow. <laughs> like, it's like, man, like, wow. Like, I'm just trying to be the best I could be. And it's like, it feels good when the best version of yourself kind of gets, somebody says something about that. Like, that's pretty cool. Get like, used to it, brother, because I think a lot of people are going to say it about you the more you speak up. That's I appreciate a, that. Thank you. You've become a beautiful, you are, you've always been a beautiful man. You've become even more beautiful. Thank you. I love you, man. Love Thanks you for hanging out with me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys for listening until the next conversation and the next pivot point in your life. Know that the mosaic is here. Know that it's possible. If you haven't read the book, please read the book. If you haven't read curiosity theory, please go out and read curiosity theory. Um, until next time, take care.